So um, what we do every week is we uh, I have about a 20 minute talk or so and then we take some time around the table and uh, discuss amongst ourselves the things that we're talking about. I, I think for me the point is always trying to figure out um, what I can find in Scripture that's going to help me throughout the week. Um, because if you're like me, there's a lot of things that will happen this week. There's a lot of things to do. Uh, you might have to go to school. Ha ha. Um, I don't have to go to school. But I have to go to work, which is a lot harder than school, and some days I miss school. Uh, uh, you, you might have to go to work, and uh, you, you might have to be at home with screaming children like my wife is. Um, but whatever it is, Whatever your life is and whatever you do with your time and with your life, um, as we were talking about last week, there is uh, a difference between um, knowing Jesus and knowing about Jesus and truly walking behind Jesus and following him. And so uh, we just finished a, a series uh, called In Exile where we were talking about the idea that we live in a world and in a culture that isn't always necessarily um, uh, open to the ideas of the Bible and the message of Jesus. And how do you live in that culture where you're, you're struggling to be in but not of, right? That, that Jesus says, you know, Lord, I pray that you not take them from the world, but that you keep them from the evil that's in the world. Um, this idea that we are intended to be in the world that God has sent us to. And so we talked about that. If you missed any of that, um, that's mostly online. I've got a couple more that I'm, I'm behind on, but um, they'll all be online eventually, and you can catch up on that. Um, for the next three weeks, though, this week, next week, and the week after, um, we're preparing for Easter season, which in the church calendar is really the most important thing. It's not often the biggest thing because it's more a thing we sort of do Easter weekend. Maybe we have an egg hunt on Saturday and then we uh, go to some church service on Sunday and we eat chocolate for no apparent reason uh, to celebrate the resurrection of the Savior. Um, <laughs> and that's what we do. That's our church thing. Um, but it's it's even more important than Christmas, which we celebrate for about six to eight weeks, I believe now, is the exact time for Christmas. Um, the, uh, the death and the resurrection of Jesus is the most important thing in all of the Bible because if that doesn't happen, and if that isn't true, then the rest of it is kind of pointless and meaningless. Paul says if um, Christ didn't rise from the dead, then our faith is worthless or meaningless. So for the next three weeks, I've, I've titled this little mini series for three weeks, um, Watershed. And I wanna talk about three things that were watershed moments in human history um, that uh, the, the, the last week of Jesus brought to culmination. Uh, watershed is a word we use, a watershed moment uh, is a word we use to indicate a critical turning point. Um, it's this moment in time when everything changes. It's a point in time after which nothing will ever be the same as before. Um, the, the figurative meaning comes from the, the literal meaning of a point or a division in a stream where that stream divides and those two new streams will never come together again. Um, a watershed or a, a turning point. And in human history, the, the death and the resurrection of Jesus is the most critical and important turning point. And deciding whether you believe that, whether you accept that Jesus died and rose again, is actually the most critical turning point in the life of every Christian. And so it's good to take some time and think about what really changed you know, in uh, two weeks from now, we'll talk about what, what was it like on the night of uh, the resurrection. There's still music playing, so I'm going to shut it down really quick. We'll edit that out of the video later, and it'll look like nothing ever happened. Um, what was it like the night of the right? We always talk about resurrection morning and Mary and Martha going to the tomb, but Sunday night is an interesting thing to me. When everybody's kind of sitting around and, and half of them are like, well, um, we've heard that Jesus rose from the dead and the other half don't believe it. And so we'll talk about that. This week, though, I want to talk about the fact that Jesus 
um, death and resurrection changes our view of religion. Religion is um, one of those things that people have a real distaste for, especially in modern American culture. If you say, oh, I'm, uh, he's a very religious person, that's usually not a compliment, right? If you say, oh, she is just so religious. Um, why is religion a bad thing? Isn't it good to be devout or religious or even moral? That's what I, I get called that a lot these days. I'm not sure why. Somebody's like, well, that's an interesting moral decision that you've made there. I, I suppose if you are into morality. Um, it's just funny to me. Religion is a good thing, I think, only if it involves your heart, and then I wonder if it's really actually religion, right? The, the problem is that a long time after the establishment of religious practices, they often become simply meaningless ritual. Think about rote prayers that you repeat over and over again. Um, when I was growing up, my, my parents made us say the Lord's Prayer every day, right? So we would have to get up in the morning, we'd say the Lord's Prayer at breakfast, and then you could freeform it the rest of the meals of the day. I'm not sure why the Lord's Prayer had to be at breakfast, but it did have to be at breakfast. The rest of the day, you could make up your own prayer. Um, and, uh, and it was funny because the, the more you said it, the less it actually meant to you. You were just sort of repeating a thing over and over again. And, and you wonder, did Jesus really intend to say, okay, here is the prayer, and I want you to memorize this and repeat it over and over again, and that's how you should pray. And, and you know, it takes about 90 seconds if you're going slow, about uh, 45 seconds if you're really blazing through because you're hungry and it's breakfast time. Uh, and that's it. I'm good. I've done the Lord's Prayer. Attending church is one of those things that can become ritualistic and wrote um, all kinds of outward signs of piety that people do. And you can think about this in, in Christianity, but you can think about it in other religions as well. And you think about the things that people do that are repetitive and that are external and that are, you know, religious things. And Jesus confronted religion. And, and in fact, you find uh, Jesus in the last week of his life, uh, you could argue that the reason that uh, he is killed and crucified and executed is that he came up against the, the leaders of the religious culture of his day, and he said, I will have nothing to do with religion that is like this, and for a bunch of reasons. Number one, Jesus confronts it because religion is often man-made. Religion is something that we make up. And you think, well, but didn't God give a bunch of laws in the Old Testament? Yeah, he did. But those laws, even though there were a lot of them, and, and Moses wrote down all kinds of things. This is what happens if you have this kind of boil or lesion, and this is what happens if you have this kind of problem, and here's what you should do if, and there's extensive amounts of law, but even though God gave very specific laws, and, and a lot of that was you know, practical, everyday kinds of things, even after that, the people of Jesus' day spent their time coming up with interpretations of the laws and then laws on top of laws and extra rules to go with the laws because when we um, come up with our man-made systems of doing things, that's what we do. We write more and more rules. Mark chapter 7, the Pharisees, some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem, gathered around Jesus, saw his disciples eating food with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. They didn't wash their hands before they eat. Now, we would look at that and say, that is unwise, that is unsanitary, but in their day, they would say, that is unholy, unscriptural, and you're probably going to hell, um, for those that believed in hell. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing holding to the traditions of the elders. So what Mark is pointing out here is that the Pharisees and all the people are not washing their hands because it's good to be clean. They're washing their hands because the elders said, you should wash your hands and make yourself ceremonially or religiously clean before you eat food. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups and pitchers and kettles. Again, this was not sanitary washing. This was ceremonial washing. So the Pharisees and the teachers of the law asked Jesus, why don't your disciples live according to the traditions of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? 
Jesus' response is like, he doesn't even answer the question. He just says, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. It's small wonder they were unhappy with him. Um, as it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. And Jesus says, you have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. Isn't that an amazing statement? You, yeah, you, you've just made stuff up. And God gives you commands and, and you, you've let go of those. And now you're hanging on to your traditions. And when people see us following man-made religion and man-made rules, when, you know, when we live in a legalistic way, they look at that and they say, you know, I'm not really interested in that. The second thing that Jesus had a severe problem with is that religion takes advantage of the weak. Continuing on with that same verse uh, from Mark, he says, and he continued, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. So he's talking about the fact that they, they make exceptions to the law, the Old Testament law, <clears throat> because of their tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. But you say that if anyone declares what might have been used to help their father or mother is korban, that is, devoted to God, then you no longer let them do anything for their father and mother. Thus you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down, and you do many things like that. He's saying their, their loophole was, well, if you say, hey, I was going to help my mom and dad, uh, you know, because they're in a nursing home now and I have to pay for that, but uh, I'm actually going to take all that money that I was going to spend to help them out, and uh, I'm going to dedicate it to God, whatever that means. And so now I don't have to honor my mother and father, and I don't have to help them out. And you've totally set aside God's commands, replaced it with your own rules, and, and you've allowed people to not help each other, to not love each other, to not take care of each other, and you've made it seem like a good religious thing to do. Mark chapter 11, on reaching Jerusalem, this is Jesus begins this week by doing this. He, he comes into Jerusalem and, and uh, you have the Palm Sunday triumphal entry thing where Jesus comes in and he fulfills you know, dozens of prophecies all in this span of a few hours. And he comes into Jerusalem and people lay down palms and he, he uh, rides across them on a donkey. And then uh, uh, Mark says that... Um, it was late in the day, so Jesus went into the temple and looked around, but it was late in the day and he was going to stay outside of town in Bethany, so he did that. Then he came back in the next day. First thing he does when he comes back in the next day is he goes to the temple and he starts throwing people out who are buying and selling there. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts, began driving out those who were buying and selling. He overturned the tables of the money changers, the benches of those selling doves, and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And, he, and as he taught them, he said, Is it not written, My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. The, te the chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this, began looking for a way to kill him, for they feared him, because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. Why does Jesus throw these people out? We're going to talk about this next Sunday morning. I'm going to do five minutes of the, of the service here at Shoreline, uh, who is our, our parent church, and we're going to... Um, uh, join with them on Sunday morning, but still have our gathering on Sunday night. I mean, talking about Jesus throwing the money changers out of the temple, not because um, uh, the issue is so much um, that um, he's anti-commerce. Jesus is not um, making some sort of political statement. Jesus is making a very clear God statement about how he feels about people who mistreat the weak and foreigners and the poor because the people who were changing money in the temples and the, the people that were buying and selling in the temple were doing that so that people could fulfill the duties of worship. So they would say, okay, well, you have to have a certain kind of dove um, for this sacrifice and you have to have a certain kind of you know, animal for this sacrifice and you have to have a certain kind of, of money to pay the temple tax and, 
And so you had this whole industry built up of people selling those things on the spot. It's a little bit like buying food um, at a sporting event, right? The guys who are inside the stadium have a really different price set than the guys who are outside the stadium. And they were making all these rules to help with that commerce, saying, well, you can't bring certain things into the temple, right? Yeah, if you want to, boy, gosh, uh, uh, I, I can't let you bring uh, that, those doves in. Those are not the right kind of doves. So, uh, but fear not, we have the right kind of doves, and you can just go ahead and purchase them. This idea that people were taking advantage of people, that they were mistreating the weak. And, and Jesus specifically uses the scripture that says, this is supposed to be a house of prayer for all nations. And one of the barriers that they're putting in front of people is, well, you have to change your money to a certain kind of money in, sort of, in order that you can worship. And this is a thing that gets Jesus on their list of people to kill. The third thing that Jesus confronted about religion, hated about religion, is that religion is about control. Religion is about um, the people at the top controlling the people that are underneath them. Again, Mark chapter 11, they arrived again in Jerusalem while Jesus was walking in the temple courts. The chief priests and the teachers of the law and the elders came to him. By what authority are you doing these things, they asked, and who gave you authority to do this? So here are the guys who are in charge, and they're saying, listen, we're in charge. This is our thing. This is our temple. This is our religion. This is our sect. We are the ruling sect. Who gave you authority to do these things? Why are you not listening to us? Because we're in control. And this whole thing that had been built up was not what God intended. The priests were intended to serve the people, right? To sacrifice for the people, to put their lives at risk for the forgiveness of people. And yet they had built up this culture where the, the Sadducees who were very rich and the Pharisees um, who were very respected had control. And every time that people try to control other people, Jesus is there to say that it's not about you controlling somebody. It's not about um, how you can um, have authority over somebody else. In fact, Jesus says, if you want to be great in my kingdom, be the servant of everybody. If you want to know who is first in my kingdom, you, he, here, here's a small child. That's who's first. That's who's best. Um, uh, Jason Upton has a great line in one of his songs. He says, what will we fear when all that remains is God on the throne with a child in his arms? Like, what do we respect? What kind of authority do we look up to? If we follow Jesus, we follow a homeless, penniless carpenter um, who is executed for believing that people shouldn't be controlling other people. Jesus' response is really great here. I will, answer, I will ask you one question. Answer me and I will tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. John's baptism, was it from heaven or of human origin? Tell me. They discussed it among themselves and they were smart enough to know this. If we say from heaven, he will ask, then why didn't you believe him? But if we say of human origin, they feared the people for everyone held that John was really a prophet. Control, right? These guys are making a political judgment here. They're saying, well... If we say it's not of God, it's of human origin, then people are going to overthrow us. We don't want to lose our power. So they answered Jesus, we don't know. Jesus said, neither will I tell you about what authority I'm doing these things. Jesus says, um, he, he challenges the authority of those who try to control others. And <clears throat> second to last thing I would say is Jesus challenges religion because religion completely misses the point. If there's anything that misses the point, it is religion. John chapter 5, Jesus is, you know, at the pool of Siloam, and he sees this guy who's been there all of his life, and, and he's trying to get some magic from the pool so that he'll be healed. And Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and he walked. That is a great thing. That is an amazing thing. I mean, can you imagine? 
Because it's not like this was, you know, some backwater. This is middle of the city. This is a place people know. And this is a person that someone had seen all the time. It would be like, um, you know, every day on my I walk to work, I'm beginning to know by face and um, it's some by name uh, the people who live around my work but not inside of buildings. Um, and uh, it's the same people and you see them all the time. And that's exactly how this was for people in Jerusalem. They would see the same person sitting there by the pool. The guy can't walk and they've known him for decades. And all of a sudden, he gets up and walks. That's an amazing thing. And the people who came and saw this guy, who asked him this question, also would have known him and also should have been kind of shocked and amazed that this guy, who is a complete paraplegic and couldn't even get off of his mat, was walking around carrying his mat, but that's not what they said. They missed the point and they said, the day on which this took place was a Sabbath. Oh no. And so the Jewish leader said to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. I don't think that the law actually is that specific about it, but um, according to them, there were all these rules of what you could and couldn't do on the Sabbath. You could walk this far, but no further. You could, you could uh, make food on Friday and you could eat it on Saturday, but you couldn't do certain things with it. The law forbids you to carry your mat. But he replied, the man who made me well said, pick up your mat and walk. And the man who made me well did something that no one else can do. And I have a feeling that he's powerful and may even be God walking amongst us. So I figure if the guy who told me to get up and walk and, and had miraculous power to make me walk said I should carry my mat, I shouldn't worry about what day it is. Mark chapter 2. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and with his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law and the Pharisees saw him eating with sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. And in another section, uh, Jesus says, The Lord said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Missing the point. The, 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 the religious leaders had forgotten what the Sabbath was actually for. They had said, oh, well, the Sabbath is now our opportunity to be very pious and be very religious and to show that we are right with God because we don't do anything on the Sabbath and isn't that wonderful and we're very, very religious people and we're following the law. And Jesus is saying, look, I'm Lord of the Sabbath and th the whole reason that we, the triune Godhead, created the Sabbath was because y'all need to rest <laughs> and you need some time off. And you, you need to relax. And, and if we didn't say, take a day off, you probably never would. And the Sabbath was made for you, not you for the Sabbath. The whole point of the thing they miss. And that's what religion does. Religion focuses on, on the rule. It focuses in on control. It focuses in on self-righteousness, on, on making yourself look better because you, you've done all of these things. And it forgets that actually there are people in hearts and souls and all those kinds of things involved. You should be excited that somebody uh, who can't walk can walk even if it's on a Saturday. The last thing I, I think I would say about this is religion can't save you. Jesus um, confronted religion and he, um, he overthrew religion because in the end, not even the law can save you. Paul says that God gave us the law as a, as a school teacher, as an instructor. God gave us the law to say, hey, just in case you're curious, you're not righteous. <laughs> you're just not. Let's prove it. Here are all the things that are right, and here are all the things that are wrong. So here are a bunch of laws. And if you break one of these laws, you're guilty of breaking all of these laws. If you, if you lie, it's just as bad as if you murdered, right? Because sin is sin, and because sin separates us from God, and you can't be right 
with God if there's sin in you. And here's the law. Now, go ahead and try and keep that. Oh, wow, we can't keep it. Okay, so there's a sacrificial system that is a precursor. It's a shadow that shows us that Jesus is coming. It says, okay, we will sacrifice someone else to cover up for your sins. In this case, it'll be animals and bulls and goats and all these things. But the point of the law wasn't that you could be righteous by following the law or that it was even possible. Jesus says, you know, you bind up all these rules and you put them on people and you can't follow them and and the people who you put them on can't follow them. And you know that and you give them this dead religion. Romans chapter 8. I'll read it uh, in the message as is sometimes my habit. God went for the jugular when he sent his own son. He didn't deal with the problem as something remote and unimportant. In his son Jesus, he personally took on the human condition, entered the disordered mess of struggling humanity in order to set it right once and for all. The law code, weakened as it always was by fractured human nature, could never have done that. The law code could never have done that. In the NIV, it says um, uh, be, what the law could not do because it was weakened by uh, human nature. God did by sending Christ. <coughs> the law always ended up being used as a band-aid on sin instead of a deep healing for it. And now what the law code asked for but we couldn't deliver is accomplished in us as we instead of just redoubling our own efforts, simply embrace what the Spirit is doing in us. What a fantastically freeing thing. Instead of just redoubling my effort this week, instead of just trying harder to be a better person, what I could not do, what was not possible for me by trying to be good and trying to follow the law, Jesus did And all I simply have to do is embrace what the Spirit is doing in me. That makes for a lighter, freer week, right? Instead of saying, okay, well, I got to be good and I got to be right and I got to be a good example and I got to be a good witness to people and I got to do all of the right things. No, the, the, the truth of the cross and the truth of Jesus' message is that we can relax and that we can embrace what the Spirit is doing. Um, um, uh, another scripture calls it, you know, the unforced rhythms of grace. You know, following what Jesus is doing, being a part of what he's doing, following after him. Jesus says, if you're tired and weary and burdened, you know, come and follow me and learn from me and see how I do it and take my burden because it's easy. Uh, and my burden is light, my yoke is easy, my teaching, my yoke. So simply embrace what the Spirit is doing is. Religion can't save you. The Spirit can. Jesus says the whole point of this thing, because religion, this is the point, was not that you could be saved by doing all the right things, but that you couldn't, that you needed someone, and here I am. So religion is the, the biggest, uh, the beginning part of this watershed moment in human history. Jesus confronts religion And he says religion is insufficient and religion is actually the enemy as much as sin is. And so um, we always take a few minutes to talk. And what we'll do tonight is uh, we'll talk about the questions that are actually on the back of your sheet. Uh, I normally have them on the screen, but I've got them printed out on the table. And here's a few questions to get you started. And you might want to come up with entirely different questions and ignore my questions. That's okay. Let's start here. How has Jesus set you free from religion? Have you had a religious past or religious background that Jesus has set you free from? Uh, Second, in what ways are you tempted to fall back into a religious mindset? In in what ways are you kind of tempted to be like, oh, I I wanna um, act and think in a religious way? Um, Number three, it's been said, one of our little Christian sayings that we have is, following Jesus is a relationship, not a religion. Is that true for you? Do you think that's true for most Christians? And what does that phrase actually really mean? So why don't we take a few minutes, talk that through, take about 10 minutes or so. Sometimes I have one last thought, but I don't have a last thought tonight. So whenever you're done, just go ahead and be done. And we'll start tearing her down at some point. And uh, thanks for 
talking with us tonight.